All right. Hello, everyone. Or as we say in Switzerland, with the dark Tana. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here with you today. And, uh, and I love animation. And today, I'd like to share uh, some of my insights of designing interactions, uh, like micro interactions at Google, at Information Architects, and also as a freelancer for various projects. So let's initialize this presentation. All right. So you know, Ever since I started in this field, I had a complicated relationship with animation. I, I knew I always liked it, but I didn't quite understand why I liked it so much. So I started to reach out to some of my peers and ask them, why do you like animation? And most of them would tell me that it's about creating delightful experiences. But then I wondered, what makes an experience delightful in the first place? Is it when it's effortless, like loading new tweets on Twitter? Or is it when it's seamless, when data is automatically loaded? Well, I think it's when people experience flow, when they become involved in an experience as a whole. Because when you think about it, interaction models like pull to refresh have been refined specifically to keep you in the flow of an app. And a lot of research has been done on the concept of flow. And Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, a great man with a great name, uh, defined it as the holistic experience that people feel when they act with total involvement. Now, what I found interesting while uh, reading his book was that he also mentioned that people experience flow. People are in a flow state. They get a sense of ecstasy, a sense of inner clarity, and they find the experience itself intrinsically rewarding. So much, in fact, I, that they would even be willing to pay for it. And you know, the more I thought about this, the more I figured, well, that's pretty much how I want people to feel, people who get in touch with my work. But unfortunately, not all animation contributes to flow. So. Uh, Recently, I was trying to find like uh, some plugins for Sublime Text. Yes, I'm still using Sublime Text. Anyone else You're still using Sublime Text here? Yes. Cool. All right. So, and as I was f uh, looking forward to discover great content, what I found instead was this. <laughs> now I call them social media buttons on crack. You can uh, <laughs> call them whatever you want, but we probably all agree it's some bullshit right there, right? <laughs> So, uh, and if you think about it, it's a pretty evil technique, right? Because we're evolutionarily programmed to look at things that move. So we can't help ourselves but look at those funny little buttons. And then there's this other example from The Verge. So The Verge, they, uh, they published an article about, oops, all right, let's see. It's a wiggly one, okay. Okay, we're back. Uh, all right, so uh, Verge published an article about fanboys of different brands. So in this case, I'm uh, accessing this website from my MacBook, so it has the, the Apple style uh, of the article. And as you start scrolling, you get those uh, little fun uh, notifications. And at first, it's really surprising, but then it really becomes predictable. And at some point, uh, in fact, instead of enhancing the article, it actually distracts from the content itself, so much in fact that most people probably didn't notice that I'm holding up a bar of Swiss chocolate here. <laughs> so, and then quite, there's questionable animation, animation that doesn't really solve a problem. So one of my favorite examples here is Caddy Suites. So if you go to their website and you have a client login here on top, let's see what happens. So you tap here, and then you have a show more button. So let's see what happens. Show more, <laughs> uh, show less. No more, I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> Life is all about decisions, right? Uh, so I don't know what happened here, but we probably all agree this animation should be illegal. Um, and then, recently, I, was, uh, I decided to renovate my apartment to make a design project out of my, my own place. So as a result, I was trying to find a great new couch. So I went to this wonderful website here, and I already have like an aversion to sidebars, but this one took it on a whole new level. Instead of focusing on content, it's like, hey, you want to navigate a little bit? Leave me, leave me alone. You know, crazy stuff. So, and then we have people who tell us that we should apply the Walt Disney animation principles, the 12 Walt Disney animation principles in design to, to our work. So what initially looks like this, all of a sudden looks like this. Now, imagine you have to type your credit card data into a form like this. It's probably not exactly trustworthy. It feels like the whole interface is made out of soap and tapping on a button will probably like 
show some uh, some bubbles or something. Now I'm not saying that the 12 volt Disney animation principles aren't useful, but we really have to ask ourselves how we how far we want to go because we can really over animate a brand or an interface in general. So I think what's interesting here though is that it shows how much animation actually conveys. So animation can be very subtle. So this slight like bouncing and movements can be really subtle, and yet it communicates so much about the personality of the interface. So aiming for delight is not enough. It's about creating meaningful interactions. And I think in order to get there, we have to start thinking in spatial terms. Now, when we navigate websites or apps, we're often taken from one context to the next, from one screen to the other. But during this whole journey of navigation, we rarely consciously ask ourselves how these different information environments relate to one another from a space and time perspective. When it comes to designing digital experiences, it's tempting to ignore all the real-world limitations that we have and just do our own uh, little thing. But it turns out that's not such a, gr such a great idea. George Miller, one of the fathers of cognitive psychology, already observed in 1968 that we perceive our environment in spatial terms. So when we navigate places like cities, uh, we build mental models just like when we navigate on screens. So for instance, when you go to New York, how do you navigate? How do you orient yourself? You see the Empire State Building, and based uh, on this building, based on this landmark, you find yourself on a map, unless you use Google Maps, of course, and are more uh, modern ways of doing it. But, um, and when these landmarks, landmarks, they behave the same on mobile screens or in digital design, but in digital design, the landmark can be the logo, it can be the search bar, it can be the navigation. So if these landmarks are too different from one breakpoint to the other, we often experience a disconnect, wondering whether this is still the same experience. But I think the best example that comes to my mind is when I connect my Mac to an external screen. Now when I connect my Mac to an external screen, and it's on the left, but I configured it to be on the right, the whole experience becomes completely uh, unusable. I have no idea how my cursor moves anymore, and even though I know I deliberately misconfigured it, I still can't make sense of the experience anymore. And that just shows how deeply ingrained our spatial perception uh, of our environment really is. So when we look at our screens, for instance, we see one screen filled with apps. But what's happening in our mind is actually quite different because our mind already knows that this is like a screen and there's like a set of con uh, contagious screens uh, next to each other. So when you look at the way the home screen is de uh, designed, for instance, on the uh, on iOS 10. So when you look at it, you, can, you have like your different set of apps, and once you reach the end, you can't continue, right? So Apple could have easily said, well, why do we not just start at the beginning again? Well, because that's not how the real world works, right? You don't just, uh, you're not here, and then you're suddenly back uh, on the other side, unless you literally traveled around the whole globe. Um, so that's, and these limitations of the real world are some sort of skeuomorphism that sneak into our digital experiences, whether we want it or not, but it can help us understand how information is distributed across the screen. And it's not always easy to get this right. So this is Write App, one of the many imitations of IA Writer, and at first it looks like a normal writing app, right? So uh, let's start writing here, and obviously it has a hamburger menu, um, so let's see what happens when you tap on that hamburger menu. So you tap there, you get a sidebar, that's fine, okay. Let's close it. Let's look at this again. There's another hamburger menu, and a side panel, and it's scrollable, and you can tap on it, and there's yet another panel, and the other panel is in fact also scrollable, and there's another panel that comes in from the right. So as you can see, this experience is completely irritating because it's like a cheap magic trick when someone just like uh, moves things under your finger and you don't really know what happened, and it becomes really hard to understand. So I came up with uh, five criteria that I use uh, daily in my work that I like, uh, because frankly also 12 Walt Disney principles are just too many to remember, so I had to boil it down to five. Uh, and I call it the elements of meaningful transitions. Uh, and it's orientation, it's responsiveness, timing, easing, and personality. So let's start with the most fundamental of all, that's orientation. So motion establishes relationships and creates context. Imagine this is a simple page, and you tap on contact. So we know something just happened here. But we're also not quite sure what exactly happened, right? And that's kind of like the blessing and the curse of digital navigation is that it can literally take you from one place to the other in no time. But 
in interaction design, moving from one information space to another does take a certain amount of time. And we can use motion to represent time in digital design. So let's look at the same example again, but animated this time. So you click on contact, and now you see what you're missing out, right? Now you see how the animation works. It makes it very obvious. So let me give you a real world example on this. This is Ryu theme, uh, one of the best selling, like one of the most popular WordPress themes at the time. And obviously it has a hamburger menu. Uh, and I love tapping on hamburger menus because you never know what you're gonna get. Uh, so let's, let's do that. So we tap and bam, in your face, right? So something happened here. We're not really sure what, but something happened. So the first time I used this, I remember very well, I didn't know how to get out of it again. So I actually reloaded the website. It was quite a dramatic way to get out. Um, and then I did some modifications on the theme uh, just to see if it would help to make it more understandable. So you tap, and now it becomes pretty obvious, right? So this panel actually slides down the whole website. Now, is this a good interaction model? That's a different question, but that's also not really the point. But the point is that the animation explains how the, uh, how the interaction works, and it also teaches users automatically how to get out of it again, because they see what they're missing out. They, they literally see what's happening. So motion is not a detail. It can make or break the experience. When you tap on an icon and it morphs from one state to the other, that's not just a detail, but it also explains you the current state of the interface, and it also explains you what happens next when you tap on it again. One of uh, my favorite examples is the quartz search. When you tap on the search icon, you get this huge nice blinking cursor. And it makes me feel understood because I tapped on the search icon and in, unless in many, unlike in many other instances where you have to tap again on the search box, you know that feeling when you tap on the search icon and then you have to tap again on the search box and someone hasn't really finished their work. Um, and it's crazy that a simple blinking line of text can say so much. It's like, hey, I'm friendly. You can type here, you know? Um, so good motion design can establish relationships and if you think about it, we've come a long way in interaction design. We started by mostly using dialog boxes and using it for everything, also because it was so easy with JavaScript to, uh, <laughs> to create dialog boxes. Uh, and then we started to understand that there's a better way to go about this, a way that keeps context, right? So today, we seamlessly animate from one state to the other, and that's also something that the Google Material Design Guidelines uh, strongly encourage. And these concepts became more and more refined the more we learned about them. If you look at the first material motion spec, that was an example that was in there. So it's like a, an image app, and you can tap on one of those images. And then you get this sidebar. There's nothing, it's not so wrong, right? But then they refined it with this one. So in this case, you tap again, but the image emanates from the top position of your finger. And that basically makes the interaction much more seamless because as a user, not just in a movie when it's recorded, but also as a, as a user, it feels way more like action and result are way more connected. And I always underestimated how important this is. So let me tell you a story of where I learned actually how important this is. So uh, last year, uh, the whole, everyone was like talking about conversational interfaces uh, to the point where I actually became where I got a little scared, right? So one morning I asked this question on LinkedIn, what's your plan after chatbots take over and designers are no longer needed? And that was a bit of an ironic question, but Rafael Lideritz, who is a product manager at Google, had a pretty straightforward response. <laughs> now, he was joking, hopefully. Uh, by the way, he is a really nice guy. So, um, but uh, I found this interesting because I knew he was joking, but he still had a point where will designers like me, fit into this AI revolution, into the revolution where like conversational interfaces are providing a lot of services in a very lightweight way. So rather than being scared, I decided to find out and turn my website into a chat. So if you go to my website, uh, the first thing it's gonna say is scroll if you don't feel like talking. So if you don't scroll, it starts talking to you. So it says, hi, I, I'm Adrian. I'm a UX designer from Zurich. What do you want to know? And notice how those little animations uh, make the conversation feel more alive. Without the animation, it would feel like a static thing, like a pre-scripted thing, which in fact it is, but the animation makes it look like it's something different. And it also makes it more feel like an environment that we're used to chat. So if you use iMessage or something, everything is beautifully animated, so it feels like a, a, a real-time conversation is happening. So notice how we have two suggestions at the bottom, so now you can tap on tell me more. 
Um, let's see. And this is actually the magical piece of this animation. This was uh, the one that I spent the, the longest working on, but it was also the most critical one. Since as a user, you can tap on something and you can see how it affects the conversation, a lot of people felt like those, those were their own words. So a lot of people reached out uh, to me on Twitter and asked me, hey, that was a really interesting experiment. Uh, which kind of natural language technology, natural language understanding technology did you use? And I was really confused. Obviously, it was just a, a set of pre-scripted responses. But it was the animation that made people feel like those were their own words, their own thoughts and ideas. So I had this crazy story happening to me when I lost my wallet on the lake in Zurich. And then uh, as I was on my way home, and there was my passport and everything in it, so it was a mess. And then on my way home, I opened my email, and there was a guy writing me, hey, by the way, I think I found your wallet. And I was like, what the hell? That's technology working for me right there. It's amazing. And, uh, and then we, uh, so we, we, we kept texting. I, I sent him an email. Can we meet up? So we met up. And then I asked him, hey, by the way, how did you get in touch with me? And then he just looked at me confused and said, what do you mean? We had a chat, no? <laughs> and, I was, and I was crazy because we, we went from email, we went from website to email to, to SMS to phone call before we actually met up. For, but for him, all that mattered was the threat, the, the idea of one ongoing topic that we carried through those different channels. So motion can not just create orientation, but it can literally change the way people feel about an interface. All right, so let's talk about responsiveness. So in interaction design, a responsive interface, this isn't necessarily about breakpoints, uh, but it's also about instantly reacting to the user's input. So just like good interaction design, good animation is responsive. So what makes an animation responsive? Well, the first thing we have to understand is animation is not a movie. When we think about animation, most of the time we go into a, one of our favorite tools and then we design like an A to B transition. But oftentimes these, these interactions, they don't just have like a finite uh, end state, but there are a lot of intermediary states. Uh, one, uh, one example of this is a, a website that my friend David Erne from Switzerland made for an insurance company for, for babies. So what happens here is when you scroll, you can see how you have like different packages basically and that each package has like, has like different benefits and you can scroll through these benefits and as you scroll down you can see how all these different packages become part of what you get right so when you buy an insurance there you know that all these things are part of your package so the whole animation is not just interactive but it also tells the story of you kind of progressing towards the destination which is ultimately to buy an insurance but these can also be less uh, it doesn't have to be so dramatic. It's also like small things like in Safari when you scroll down and scrolling up indicates like a change in context and then just adding a little bit of screen space can go a long way on mobile devices. So all these little changes can really add up. Ted does a similar thing uh, when you scroll down and uh, you want to read the transcript for instance or you want to read the comments because we all like to read comments. Um, you can see how the video still keeps playing uh, on top for, for your reference. So we can use animation to progressively show content when needed. So this is a pattern that is very famous by now, the float label pattern. Uh, and I really like this pattern, but one of the things that I miss in most implementations I see is this little detail here. Notice how the label itself has like a slight animation on top. And this animation is actually really important because this animation reinforces the idea that the label is the float label, that the placeholder is in fact a pattern. That's just the one and the same thing, because in most implementations you just have the label appearing, but it doesn't communicate the same idea. Another example that I really love is WhatsApp. This is actually pretty old by now, and that makes it even more <laughs> amazing, uh, because the way they implemented it is unbelievable. So when you send a voice message on WhatsApp and you tap the voice button, it says slide to cancel, and there's a slide like if you're going the, uh, through the text, and then if you slide it to the left, whip, boom. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fantastic, right? And the animation like this is not just, it's not just an animation, but it's really, uh, it's really a story. So good animations is responsive and tells a story. It tells a story how an interface works, and it tells a story that makes the product itself more emotional and useful. So let's talk about time. 
animation and movement is all about time. Ironically, we perceive time to be something spatial as well. When we talk about time, we talk about it like, we say things like, oh, that's behind me, oh, that's still in front of me. And it feels like today is here, yesterday is there, and the future is somehow over there, right? And this has an implication on how we design things. For instance, when we draw a timeline, those of us who speak uh, English will put the past on the left. Those um, of us who speak Arabic will put it on the right. And those of us who speak Chinese will put it at the bottom. So what does this mean when we design interfaces? So for instance, when you navigate through an interface and you go from left to right, so you can see how this spatial perception here reinforces the idea by moving from left to right, it subconsciously communicates that you're progressing towards the destination. It would feel completely weird if it would go the other way around. And even though we look at this every day, we kind of take it for granted, right? And in fact, when you talk to people uh, who are from other countries where things are quite the opposite, they, they will tell you that it's in fact wrong, but that I've just gotten used to it so that it doesn't really uh, matter anymore for them. Um, but animation also, like the one key principle that's really important is that we keep in mind how to make, what to pick the right duration for an animation. So research actually shows that there are like different phases on, the, on how we perceive time. So there's like a hundred milliseconds delay, and if there's a hundred, everything within a hundred milliseconds delay is not perceivable, so you can't tell the difference. And there's a one second delay, and within this delay, you do obviously notice the difference, but you're not, you, you don't switch context, so you're not suddenly like thinking about other things. And then there's the 10 seconds delay, which basically means at this point on you will start uh, to switch uh, context and think about other stuff. So usually the sweet, uh, the sweet spot is between 100 and, and 300 milliseconds. Because motion should never feel like it's slowing down the experience. So when it feels like designers are forcing you to look at their little masterpiece over and over again, it's really super annoying, right? Even though it's nice in the beginning, animations like this don't scale. It's not delightful at all. So the important part here, though, is the feeling part. Because motion can affect the way we perceive time. When people are waiting, or when you look at something like this, uh, we, our, our minds are automatically kept busy. So we are pattern seekers. So whatever we look at, especially things that move, we try to identify patterns. What is this guy doing? Uh, why is it moving like this? And then even though there's no pattern at all, our brain will still come up with reasons why there should be a pattern. And this actually changes the way you perceive time. Instead of focusing on the time passing, you focus on the animation. There's a famous experiment also that shows that when a uh, triangle uh, collides uh, with a rectangle uh, for many times, they asked participants in a famous study, uh, how do you feel about the triangle? And it's just a triangle, but most people said, it's kind of an asshole triangle. <laughs> why, is it, uh, why is it always kicking that rectangle? Just leave it alone, you know? And even when, you, even when we look at this, right, we kind of feel like this guy is a bit drunk and, and this one has other issues. So it's, it's interesting. Um, so people have feelings about things that are sometimes justified, but sometimes they're not. So for instance, when Facebook used their custom loading indicator, uh, people attributed the slowness of Facebook to Facebook itself. But when they then switched it over to the native iOS spinner, all of a sudden people felt like iOS was slow instead. So if you have a slow app, go for the native spinner. Um, so all major tech companies take advantage of animation uh, to basically mask some of the latencies that are hard to get rid of, uh, like ghost loading in this example here, uh, where the content eventually um, replaces the ghost loading uh, animation. Another element that impacts time perception is frequency variation. So we know from, uh, from perception, like from psychological perception psychology, <laughs> uh, that when things are animated in a subtle way, we feel like it's faster than it really is. If you add ribbings uh, moving in the opposite direction, it makes the animation and the illusion even more intense, and people think that it's up to 10% faster than it really is. Uh, but, so when it comes to performance, subjective performance is often way more important than technical performance itself. And there's another interesting example here that Blogger had. When Blogger uh, created their first version, they had like a long sign-up process. Uh, we had, we had to go through those all, all those long signed up processes. Now we do better, hopefully. 
Uh, but at the end of the sign-up process, there was a button which said, like, create block, right? And when you tapped on that bot button, the block was created immediately. And then people were, like, uh, feeling weird about it. A lot of people said, wait, that, that, that way went way too fast. Something must have gone wrong here. Uh, so what, like, what did Blogger do? They, not, they did nothing but add a little spinner animation that would turn around a couple of times. And then all of a sudden, people felt, oh my god, that's great. I'm so glad that Blogger is do, doing all the heavy lifting here for me. I could never set up a blog myself. <laughs> so duration can add significance to our interactions. Um, so con conventional wisdom tells us that faster is always better, but it really uh, depends on the context of what you're building. Because sometimes you actually want an interaction to take a little bit longer to make it feel more significant. All right, so let's talk about easing. So easing always reminds me of what a friend from IA once said. Out of all hand throwable things, Socks have the most unpredictable trajectory. Lauren Gridino, creative technologist, great friend, very wise man. Um, and what I found interesting is that, in fact, throwing socks can be interesting because it follows the laws of gravity and physics. Now, unfortunately, computers couldn't care less about gravity and physics. So without some love, most animations will look like this. Robotic, boring, and most of all, unnatural. And that's where motion curves come into play. So what, what is a motion curve? A motion curve describes how an animation behaves over time. So it might be faster in the beginning and slower at the end, or vice versa. So a friend of mine, Izara, who is an After Effects instructor, uh, always told me that I should think of motion curves as somebody snowboarding down a hill. And since I'm from Switzerland, I really like this idea. So I created a little animation to show how it looks like. So imagine you have like... Uh, a steady curve. Imagine you have like a flat curve. So this is how it would look like. <laughs> that was shitty, right? That was, <laughs> that was pretty painful to watch. Uh, so what we do we do in this case? Our eyes are incredibly trained to spot things that move unnaturally. So what do we do? We have to fiddle around with the motion curve. So in this case, we probably want this to be a steep curve in the beginning and then a little bit flatter uh, at the end. Something like this. So let's uh, look at the same example again. So I did a little dramatic zoom in effect to make my point here. It's a bit of cheating. Uh, also this animation was far from being perfect, um, but that's kind of the point, right? Because if you do motion design, perfecting animation is, takes a lot of work, but that's what, makes, that's what separates normal animation from really great motion in interfaces. So if the motion curve isn't right, the animation won't delight. That's uh, the way I think about it. It's easy and sticks. Um, and in the real world, this actually is even more important because in the real world, things don't move in perfect unison. So if you look at this, if you look at how animation can guide our attention, something interesting is happening here. At first, we are spending, we um, focus on this one, right? But then as, at the end, since the animation has basically come to an end with the easing and the movement is less dramatic, we automatically switch over to this one. Um, and that's a really interesting principle that I use all the time when, I, when you go from one scene to the next, you have to get rid of one thing and maybe a couple of other things are coming in. You can always use the last thing that's animating to basically guide users' attention. The, the eye is incredibly well tuned, like well calibrated to perceive things that move. And the last thing that's animating, you can basically guide users' attention. So in my case at work, it's often a fab or something, and you have like a staggered animation where different things come in, and then the fab co always comes at the end because that's what you want the user to look at. So again, if the motion curve isn't right, the animation won't delay. I really like this uh, obvious. <laughs> and then we have personality. Now, personality comes at the very end of the design process. And when you think about animating, you really want to ask yourself, do you want to be more on the playful side or more like be on the serious side? While at the same time making sure you don't over-animate your brand or create animations for the sake of animation itself. I was incredibly fortunate to having met Don Lindsay um, a couple of years ago. Don Lindsay was the VP of design at Apple uh, when they uh, introduced like the first uh, new OS 10, or actually the first OS 10, the whole redesign. OS 10 Aqua, it was called. And he told me that the idea of Aqua was that sense of uh, liquidity, 
that sense of lickability, as Steve would call it. He basically told them make it, make the interface lickable. The buttons need to look like you want to lick them off the screen. So Don had to figure out, okay, let's uh, let's see how we design this. And um, so they used animation uh, throughout the whole interface to reinforce that idea of liquidity. Uh, so what you're about to see is the first time that Apple introduces the dock. Let's check it out. This is the dock. It's at the bottom of the screen. It always stays centered. And it allows me to put things into it. I can put all sorts of different things into it. How do I put things into it? Well, I can drag things into it. But let me show you a much cooler way to get things into it. I've got these three buttons up here. One puts, closes the window. The other maximizes it. The third minimizes it, the middle one. Where does it go when a window minimizes? Well, it goes here. And you notice my dock just grows, right? So you heard the audience reaction. That's now 16 years ago. And there I am still talking about this topic, right? Uh, it's crazy when you think about it. And Don also told me how developers loved him because uh, of the genie effect, because they, his team basically created this genie effect, and everyone hated him, <laughs> because it's a lot of work to get this done, right? And when we were having dinner, there was another guy uh, with us, and he asked, hey, Don, why do you think uh, OS X still looks so much the same, the same way that you guys initially designed it? And then he just said, you know, we did a hell of a job. And I really like this uh, response. So. Animation isn't just functional, it can also be used to reward users. For instance, in Inbox, when swiping through all your emails, you get this animation as a reward. It's a positive reward, which can also help to establish uh, a positive habit for users. Um, another thing is that it can also be delightful. If you look at the star animation on Twitter, why is something just going from gray to yellow or orange if it can also be animated? So a little animation doesn't hurt here, hurt here and there. And also, again, it also has like the active and inactive states again. So I also use animation at work often to reward users. And one of the ways I used it as well was in the UX fair. So last year, uh, we introduced like uh, UX design, CC and I introduced the UX fair. And the UX fair is basically a conversational assistant for designers that talks to you about news uh, in design every day. Uh, so what happens if you go to uxchat.me, you can see how the bear is saying, Konnichiwa, how are you doing, you know? And then, you can, uh, and then it asks you like different questions. And sometimes when it tells you about articles and it knows that you've seen the article before, if it, it has discussed a certain topic like icons with you, for instance, then it will ask you a follow-on question maybe the week later. So in this case, uh, I, talked about, I talked to Oliver Reichenstein, right? And Oliver wrote a blog post about icons. And it talks about the ambiguity of, uh, of icons. So in this case, for instance, what do you think does this icon here stand for uh, in Gmail? Does it stand for spam or for important? Hands up for important. I got you. That awkward moment when you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's spam, right? So if you tap on spam, you can see how you get like this confetti animation, and you also earn some fishes. That's another story with the fishes. Uh, but with the confetti animation, it kind of reinforces that idea of reward, of gratification, of something positive that is happening. Now, when Facebook Paper was announced, people went crazy. Facebook Paper's motion design uh, was so smooth at the time that it literally changed the way people designed apps on iOS. Um, it had extremely responsive animation, perhaps even too responsive at times. And Facebook Paper had really good intentions for it. They also open sourced their animation framework, and it uh, was received very well. However, we all know how Facebook Paper itself turned out, right? It wasn't exactly a success, and that's kind of the point, right? If you design something that looks really beautiful and has beautiful animation, but it doesn't really solve a new problem, then it's not good design and people are not going to use it. So animation is not going to save our asses. And then we have animations we just don't forget. Like this one, this is uh, also an older animation, which is still one of my favorites. If you go to readme.io and you enter uh, your password, uh, the owl <laughs> closes its eyes. So you can, uh, you can type here safely. No problem. And another one of these is uh, the Yacht app. In this case, when it's, uh, this is a uh, Yacht app, like a, basically like a proposal I found on Dribbble. What's interesting here is since the whole uh, app is about boats, 
they use the loading indicator and basically use that playful element of liquidity if it like loads slowly. And again here it's a great example not because of the animation itself which is really beautiful though but also because it distracts you from the fact that something is loading, right? You look at this animation, it keeps you busy and when you think about the loading time it's not as bad as it would be if you just show a full screen spinner or something like that. So personality isn't the experience but it can enhance the way we design. So we've covered a few points here today. We started with orientation and how spatial thinking affects the way uh, we design interfaces. And then we went on and talked about responsiveness, how animation is not just static but dynamic to the user's input. We went on and talked about time, how animation can change the way we feel about time. And we talked about easing and discussed how easing can be used to make animations more playful, more natural, but also to guide the user's attention. And eventually we talked about personality, how we can use motion to give product a soul. So I think combining all of these principles uh, allows us to animate in a way that can support rather than break the experience. And animation is still a relatively young topic and we still have a lot to learn. So uh, hopefully some of these ideas here uh, resonated with you and hopefully you think about them when you animate the next time. Thank you so much.